So this was really easy and here's my solution. So all you have to do is you grab the left value, you grab the right value and then if those values are both larger than the minimum distance then you compute the derivative which is actually the difference quotient and you append this. And if either one of those two is smaller than the minimum distance well we don't care about the real derivative at that position so we'll just return zero in that case because that means later we will not detect the start or the end of a cylinder. So now let's run this and here's the result for scan number seven. So you see we have those six spikes going down here each representing one cylinder in the real world and our derivative produces for every falling edge a negative peak and for every rising edge a positive peak and if we have a look at the range of those values we can see that the peaks are stronger than 100 and minus 100 so we will just use a threshold of plus minus 100 to detect the falling or rising edge caused by a cylinder. Let's run this for another scan. So for scan number 235 we have the situation that there is one of those peaks of erroneous measurement values. So in the measurement data there's here the signal for the cylinder and shortly before that we have one of those peaks going down to 15 or something like that. So if you look at our derivative we see that our detector worked perfectly. So it ignored this strong peak but it responded to the falling edge caused by the cylinder. So the next thing we'll have to do is to write a program which detects those signals and determines the start and the end of every cylinder in the scan. But there's one caveat with that. Remember there were situations in our scan where there was one cylinder in the foreground and there was a smaller cylinder which was partially occluded in the background. So in that case our scanner hits the wall, then it starts to hit this background object, then the foreground object and then it's going back to the wall again. So in terms of measurement data we'll have this background measurement, then we will have a negative slope for the first cylinder and then a second negative slope for the second cylinder in the foreground and then it will go back up again. So in this case our method will indicate us there's a left start well, and there's again a left start and then here's the right, the end of the cylinder. Meaning we have to cope with situations which are unusual. So instead of obtaining left right, left right, left right and so on we might also get left left, right or we also might get left right right. So here's my strategy to solve that problem. Say our original signal is like that. We do have a cylinder in the background, and then another cylinder, and then it goes back up again. So our derivative will be like that. The peak here, another peak here, and a positive peak here. And our threshold will indicate a left, a left, and a right edge. Now these points are all discrete. So I might have those five points here, then two points here, and four points here. So what I'm interested in is this point. So it is the average depth and the average ray that will indicate where the cylinder is. So my strategy is as follows. I have one variable called on cylinder where I memorize if I'm currently on a cylinder. And as long as I'm on a cylinder I will add up the rays and the depths. So I have a ray counter, I have a sum of the rays and I have a sum of the depth. So when I start I'm not on a cylinder so this will be false. And I just walk through those values. You say this is value 0 and at value 5 my derivative indicates a depth jump. So I'll switch to on cylinder mode true and I'll initialize the rays so zero so far the sum of rays zero and the sum of the depth. So now for this value 5 say the depth would be 50. So add this up I have now one ray that's ray number 5 and the sum of the depth will be 50. Now I go over to number 6 as long as it is true I will add up those values. So I will have two rays the sum of rays will be 5 plus 6 and the sum of the depth will be 50 plus 50. Now when I have another depth jump I will just discard all the measurements I made so far. So the on cylinder stays true. I will just reset everything and start over again. And now I have the points 7, 8, 9 and 10. And it will go on like that. So it will sum up the rays. One ray, say the depth here would be 40. The sum of the rays will be 7, and the depth 40. And it will go on like that. And when I'm here, then I will have counted four rays. The sum will be 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. So I will have four depth values of exactly 40 in this example. Now if my derivative indicates a positive edge, then we'll just compute the average ray, which will be 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 divided by 4, and that's 8.5, and the average depth, which will be 40. 
and I will store this as a cylinder indicating average ray and average depth. And there's one caveat with that. Remember, when you sum up the rays, you might also have those erroneous measurements here. You have to make sure that you don't incorporate these. Meaning, in that case, don't count up the rays, don't add up the sum of rays and don't add this value to the depth. So in the end, when it jumps back again here, I set the on cylinder to false. And as long as it is false, I do not add up anything. And I'll start over again when I detect the next falling edge. So I want you to program this. And so you'll find the file find cylinders question. And in this file I prepared everything already for you. So you have the compute derivative function, which is just the function that we computed previously. You have the find cylinders which you'll have to implement. And down here, there's the main function. And the main function is almost identical to the previous main function. In addition to the previous file, we now also have a depth jump variable, which indicates the threshold we are using for finding a depth jump edge in our scan data. And as in the last time, we do have this minimum valid distance. Now I load the log file, I pick the scan as in the previous data, I compute the derivative, I compute the cylinders, this is what you have to implement, and then I plot the scan and also the cylinders. Now let's have a look at the function you'll have to implement. Here's find cylinders, it gets the scan, it gets the derivative and the thresholds for detecting the jump and the invalid range measurement values. And it should produce a cylinder list. I start by assigning on cylinder the value of faults and the sum of rays, the sum of depths and the rays which are initialized to zero. And then for every point in the scan derivative, and this is where you'll have to implement the strategy we just were looking at. So you'll have to remove this just for fun. I'm generating some cylinders in this list, which then show up in the graph that this program produces. When you run it, you'll see that result. So this is the original scan and the red dots are the detected cylinders. These are not the correct results. So after you implemented the correct version, you will get a result like that. So you have here the original scan data and here the points which indicate the cylinders and their exact locations. 